tonight will be number 31, the 3 1. Saw on the, uh, the Facebook this afternoon a post about Oklahoma. Seven tornadoes confirmed touchdown this morning in Oklahoma. Uh, at least 11 injured. Uh, seen the pictures, a lot of homes destroyed. And see, with the hurricane, there's a lot of destruction, a lot of things happening right now. And uh, you, you think amid all of those things, you know, where, how do you find happiness in that? How do you find happiness whenever everything that you've taken or that, that you own is taken away from you? This morning, uh, we had a couple here visiting with us that was from Elizabethan, Tennessee. He is a deacon there at the Elizabethan Church of Christ in charge of we're dealing with uh, there around their area. The, but most importantly, the things that they were doing. They received nine tractor-trailer loads from the Church of Christ Disaster Relief and distributed all of that. On top of that, there were others that were bringing in U-Haul trucks uh, of supplies. There are, right now, they've got a... a he, he was talking about they've got a bunch of heaters. Uh, right now, he said that their main goal is, I mean, they've got enough stuff, really, but their main goal is getting people back into their homes, uh, helping with cleaning up and, and things. And you think about all that they're dealing with, and, and then I think about the flip side of that, the people who have no idea what's going on there. And what they're dealing with and all they're fussing about is who's going to get elected president. find happiness in a lot of that. His name was Brother uh, but Matt Reagan. They were, and he is, what was his wife's name? Did you say Aaron? Ah, anyhow, with, he was here with his wife uh, this morning. And uh, he was talking, he and his wife both were talking about all of the people helping you think about happiness, and you think about the work of the Lord, and you think about, you know, how do you and the people do things. That's where happiness comes from. We're going to look a little bit about that this evening. You know, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at the Beatitudes. I want you to think about happiness this morning and, and how, you know, how people view happiness. You know, in, in Jesus' day, the Jews were looking at happiness based upon, you know, they were concerned on, on fulfilling the works of the law. They were concerned on a uh, promised kingdom. Of course, in their mind, they're thinking of an earthly kingdom. They're thinking about things in this world. And Jesus tried to help them come away from, from that, help them understand really what happiness is and as we study these Beatitudes, I hope that it'll help us to understand, you know, really where happiness lies. So, first of all, I, we need to define this word that is used. If you'll notice there in verse 3 and, and continuing on, we have blessed or blessed. Or I know that doesn't mean anything to you, and it doesn't really mean anything to me either, except that that's the Greek word, and that's where it comes from. But in Strong's Dictionary, it means... Supremely blessed. It means fortunate or well off. It can be translated blessed or happy. But to me, when we think about the word happy, you know, in, in my mind, happy happens to be you know, connected so much with the things that happen to you. But that's not the way Jesus is teaching it. The word could mean being absolutely joyful for the blessings that you receive. And I think, you know, in our lives, regardless of where you are in your life, regardless of what is happening in your life, whether you're in the middle of that disaster over in, in East Tennessee and in, in North Carolina or you're over in Oklahoma dealing with that, there are blessings. And, and I think... I love that song, Count Your Many Blessings, because that's what we need to be doing. 
That's what we need to be looking at is the blessing through that just really quickly, and then we'll kind of go over some things. But, but re- think about this. All right, so why do we call it the Beatitudes? It's because in the Latin version of the Bible, uh, it's that word blessed is beati in, here in Matthew chapter 5. And so that's where they get Beatitudes. I don't know where the tudes came from, but you know, that's, they created that word for this purpose. But what we see here in each one of these verses, and, and I don't remember where I picked this up from, it, there is a characteristic and there's a consequence. So the claim in each verse is blessed or blessed, all right, or happy if, you, if your translation says happy, all right? So that's the claim. These people that it's talking about, this is, this is the state, all right? It is based upon a characteristic that is brought out in each verse, and because of that characteristic, then there is a consequence that comes from being, you know, having that characteristic. And so as we study those, then we'll see those, uh, those things. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. So as we look down through those things we, and we see, all right, there's the claim, you know, blessed, blessed, blessed. But the characteristics, they're interesting. You know, because you think about in the world, you think about what makes people happy. You know, you know where is your happy place? I, I can remember, um, there's a, and I don't remember, I think it came from a cartoon it probably was a Disney thing, but I remember on this ride at Disney World, there's a, his happy place was in the thorn bush. That, that was his happy place, but he was, you know, taunting the other one, you need to come to my happy place. Well, the other one didn't want to come to the happy place because that was thorn bush. And so one person's happy place might be somebody else's, you know, not so happy place. And so, and those things are based upon circumstances. Those things are based upon the things that we have in this world. And we, you know, maybe oftentimes, you know, around Christmas time, I, I like to, I know it's too early to talk about Christmas, but I'm going to talk about it anyhow. We, we like to drive around and see the lights, don't we? See how pretty, you know, people's made their houses and you get to ooh and ah at their decorations and all of these things. Where's the happiness in that? Well, for those people, maybe it's just the fact that you're enjoying what they've done, you know. Uh, for us, we're, we're enjoying, I like lights in, at Christmas time, I, or just winter time in general, you know, because it's so dark. <laughs> I think that's the reason why we got into this tradition of having all these lights, is because it's so dark. But all of these different things that can make us happy in this life, are those the things that make us happy? But as we think about happiness and we look at this list that Jesus gives here and we look at those characteristics, those characteristics don't have anything to do with any of the things that the world would think of as bringing happiness. And, and even, even many of these would go against what the world would think of as happiness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, blessed, blessed are those who mourn. Why put those two together? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are, you go on down through here and you see blessed are the persecuted. Those don't seem like happy things. Those don't seem like things that we want to be involved in. And yet Jesus is pointing these out and saying these are the people who are going to be blessed. These are the people who are going to be fortunate in this life if they have those characteristics. But as we look at those things for every end, you know, for they, and you got the kingdom of heaven and and so forth down through there. So let's take a brief look at each one of these 
and maybe gain some insight as to what he's talking about. I'm, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I, I think that we can hit on some of these things and maybe it'll help us learn how to be happy. You know, because we all want a little more happiness in the world, don't we? First one there in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, by and large, if we're studying from Matthew's account, we are going to look at that as being humble. Because you know, being poor in spirit is being opposite of being haughty in spirit. You know, I'm not going to be full of myself. I'm going to be humble. Yet he talks about meekness later on, and I believe the, the humility is, is more involved with that one a little bit later on. But if you look in Luke's account, of attitudes there with blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. But what he does in Luke's account is, and, and this may be a totally different sermon. Uh, keep that, and we'll study that whenever we get into that in, in Luke. But he contrasts all the things that he says blessed are. Later on, he says, woe to those. And the, the list starts with the poor in blessed. In the woes, in verse 24, it says, but woe to you who are rich. Jesus, whenever he says blessed are the poor, he's not talking about poor in spirit. He's talking about poor, poor. He's talking about people that don't really have anything and are dependent on other people. And that may be what he's talking about here in Matthew's account as well. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. How would that work? Well, you have a spirit of poverty. I mean, I, listen, we are so extremely blessed in this country to have what we have. The poorest of the poor in this country, you know, many of those people did not have food. I mean, you know, their freezers and refrigerators, if, if they kept them because the flood didn't take it away, well, they didn't have the power to run them. And so they're losing all of their food. They had to have something to eat. And so a lot of these supplies that went over there had to do with food to help them to survive some of these things. And so when you think about those going hungry, you, you know, it's not like in other countries. We have so much food and be from a poor standpoint. Why? Because nothing I own belongs to me. Nothing I own is mine. Everything that I have belongs to God. It was provided by God. I am just here holding on to it for a short time and being a steward of these things that God owns. And if we can have that mindset in some of the things that we have in this lessities that we have in life. Listen, young people, <laughs> listen to me. When I was your age, internet didn't exist. It just didn't. Cell phones were not a thing until after I graduated high school. I mean, I remember growing up and, and going to my grandparents' house and there was one air conditioner in, in the house and it was in Grandma and Grandpa's bedroom and we didn't get to sleep in there. Matter of fact, a lot of times we slept in the attic. If I tried to sleep in conditions like that, I, don't, I wouldn't get a week of sleep. Why? Because we get used to the niceties of life. When we learn to let go of some of that stuff and learn to deal with some of that stuff, and I think about those who do missionary work in other countries and, and the conditions that they deal with in those poverty-stricken places, and it, it's a completely new perspective that you have on life whenever you go and witness those things. And so maybe that's what he's talking about. I know I spent a lot of time on that aspect of it, but I think maybe that might be what Jesus was talking about here. It might have been, this is the kingdom of heaven. You see, that's where our treasure is supposed to be. It's not here. We don't, we don't look at the things here and think, man, I've got this made. You know, we're looking at heaven. So maybe that's what he's after there. In verse 4, he says, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. What is he talking about? He, you go to James chapter 4 and verse 9, and James says, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and sin. Sorrowful over sin. When, when you are a Christian trying to live a Christian life in this world and you look at this world and you see the sin that is all around you, it ought to make you mourn. 
and it ought to make you weep. You go read the minor prophets and you see how many times, the, well, even the major prophets, you see how many times that they, they complain, I'll say complain to the Lord. You know, Lord, when are you going to do something about these evil people? When are you going to do something about this evil generation? And God usually comes back with something that, you know, he's going to do. He's talking about, and of course, not just sins in the world that we see, but sin in our own life. We ought to mourn over these things. We ought to weep over these things. Because if we do that, if we mourn over sin, there is going to come comfort. Because if you're sorry about it, you're going to do something about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, he talks about, you know, the difference between the sorrow of the world and godly sorrow. He talks about blessed are the meek. The, the word meek there, uh, it has the aspect of humility with it. It's talking about gentleness. It's talking about being mild-mannered. You know, you don't, you don't blow up at every little thing. You don't overreact over every little thing. Uh, you know, sometimes we, we, get, we get kind of flustered in ourselves, don't we? And, and we let it go, and he's talking about, you know, don't do that, don't do that. I find it interesting, Moses is mentioned in the Old Testament as being meek. And, and you know, you look at the life of Moses, his anger was at the people because they were sinning, because they were doing wrong. Jesus is said to be meek. You know, he, he said, come to me all you who are laboring every heavy laden and I'll give you rest. You know, take my, my uh, yoke, there he is, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am meek and lowly in heart. You know, Jesus was seen as meek and yet, what did he do when he went into the temple? I mean, you know, he drove out those people out of the temple. Meekness. We are supposed to be doing things for the Lord. And sometimes we might get a little bit upset about godly things, people that are doing things against God and things like that. But we need to be meek and mild-mannered in that. In Psalm 37, verse 11, David said, But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. And I think that that last line helps us to understand what meekness really is. You know, it, it is talking about, you know, the, some of these things. Then it works out better for us. And so he says there at the end of verse 5, they shall inherit the earth or they shall inherit the land. Uh, that may not be necessarily earthly possessions. But regardless of what you're inheriting, those blessings are going to come from God. And so you're going to receive all of those blessings. He goes on to say in verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You know, there again, hunger and thirst, those are things that we have to do righteousness. They have a craving for righteousness. And that's the way we ought to be. We ought to have a craving to get into the Word of God. This morning, uh, I gave you three verses right in a row that talked about our diligence. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15, you know, be diligent to show yourself approved. Well, it's a desire, it's a zealousness to, to looking for righteousness, looking for those things that are right in this law. There was a time, and I've, I've told you this before, but I, I sat down and studied with a man one time, and it was getting close to supper time, and we just kept right on studying, right on studying. I don't think I even ate supper that night. But we were so deep in the Word of God and studying the Word of God that it didn't matter. I didn't feel the hunger pains because I was filled. We were, we were both filled with the Word of God. Now, that's only going to happen so long. I mean, you know, <laughs> we got our, these physical bodies have to have nourishment. But understand that, yes, we'll be filled. Of course, this, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking seek it out. And you're going to try and put that into your life. In verse 7, he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy be, uh, Being merciful means uh, being compassionate. It, it has to do with 
forgiving others, all right? So you have compassion on this one that has offended you, and you are going to forgive them. That That's your mercy. That's being merciful in those things. In Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 32, uh, Paul says, Be kind one to uh, I believe it's over in James chapter 2, and I don't remember the verse right off, but he talks about mercy and judgment and how, you know, uh, how those things work together. And you go look about some of those things. But when we show mercy to others, when we are merciful to other people, we will be shown mercy. And I believe that's what James really is getting at in, in, in his passage. Looking down in verse, having pure thoughts, pure words, pure actions, trying to live a pure life. And it makes so much sense that that's what he's talking about. When we think about coming closer to God, when we think about having a relationship with God, we must live in a way that is pure as God is. And so that's the reason why he says there at the end of that verse, they shall see God. If we try to, now we're not ever going to be pure as pure can be. It's not going to work for those things. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22, he says, Test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. We can do that. We might not do it perfectly, but we can work at that. We can try to make purity part of our lives. And then he says, Blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers are, are ones that, um, you know, when you get right down to it, a peacemaker is usually taking a loss. And whenever Jesus would imagine that most people in this world today are not accustomed to taking a loss. I'm going to do whatever I can do to make sure I gain the upper hand. I am paid for what I get. I make a profit, you know, for whatever I am, I am doing. But a peacemaker is one that a lot of times will just let all of that go. You know, if it's something that's causing problems, even though it might be good for me, but if it's not good for somebody else, I'm going to let those things go. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 18, Paul says, if it is possible as much as to peaceable with all men. Another side of that, being a peacemaker, is, is being a, you know, at peace with God. Now, in my thought process, this is not what he's talking about because in, in that relationship, God is the peacemaker. He is the one who has provided the blood of Christ and provided that, that, uh, that ability to have that relationship. So he is the peacemaker. We are just accepting that peace. But on the other hand of that, whenever we think about how many times that it is written that we need to do things about our own salvation, all right, and so we have our end of that. And so because we have our end of that, then we also are peacemakers from that standpoint. He says uh, at the end of that verse, he says, you know, blessed are peacemakers, for they shall be call called sons of God. And I think about why that is. And maybe, you know, on a person-to-person -person relationship, maybe it is because the people from the outside see that you are a peacemaker and see that you are, you know, meek and gentle and God in our lives in that. Of course, when we think about our relationship with God, then we, we think about, uh, you know, being sons of God. Well, if we're doing His will, we are sons or children of God. Then He ends up this beatitude, and I'm going to treat verses 10 through 12 together. Uh, in my Bible, verse 10 is the end of the Beatitudes, and I'll show you why I think that that, that is the case. Uh, or not, not necessarily that that's the end of the Beatitudes, but that that's the end of heaven. Well, when we talk about the persecuted in verse 10, it ends with, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so that seems to be book, bookmark, you know, book, uh, what do you call it, book stops, whatever. book ends, thank you. I knew there was a word for that. It bookends, you know, on either end of that, that that he's putting together. And maybe verses 11 and 12 is an extension of what he's talking about in verse 10. We can see the relationship uh, of those together. But let's, let's look at that. Blessed are those who are persecuted, but understand he's specific. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for the sake of God, for the sake of the church. 
for the sake of the word of God, for the sake of righteousness. That's what he's talking about. And so if we are persecuted because we are trying to live a righteous life, Peter chapter 4 and verse 16, he says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that matter. We're going to suffer as Christians if we are doing the work of God, if we are practicing righteousness in our lives. In verses 11 and 12, he says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. What about that reward that will be given if we'll hang in there if we'll stick with God's word, if we'll stick with doing his will in our lives, if we stick with being righteous, don't worry about what the world does to you. Don't worry about what the world can afflict on you, whether it's you know, uh, emotionally or, or spiritually or, or physically. It doesn't matter. Because as long as you're doing the will of God and, and trying to live that righteous life, you have a reward. It's heaven. It's, it's the, you know, the reward that is eternal life. It is the reward that you know, anything that you suffer in this life, it's going to go away. When you pass from this life, if you're righteous, you don't have to deal with that heat. If you're not righteous, it's going to get a lot hotter. It's going to get a lot hotter. The world measures happiness by what we receive in this life. And that's all it focuses on. And a lot of times, because of that, if anything goes wrong in our life, in this life, then it's woe is me, and it's the end of the world for many. Whenever I see those who suffer, that is a person who is happy, not because of circumstances in this life, but in spite of circumstances in this life. You know, you just throw whatever you can throw at me. As long as I'm a child of God, it's going to end up happy. I'm not going to say I'm going to be happy through the whole thing. <laughs> but it's going to end up happy. It's going to be, end up well. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, For yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where neither thieves break in, and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I think that applies in so many ways to so many things that are in our life. You know, maybe it's not the treasures of this world, but maybe it's the cares of the world. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's a lot of things that is in this world that we, we put so much faith in and so much care in that whenever those things are snatched away from us, it destroys our world. Well, how about let's put some insurance in our life because if we make him a priority then it doesn't matter what happens we're going to be happy we're going to be blessed in this life happiness begins with being a child of God the Lord has given us a way that we can be happy regardless of what happens and that happiness comes in knowing that I have a life after this life that I have a, a place to go to whenever I'm gone from this world. I have a new body to live in once this body is destroyed. All these things are tied up in salvation. And the Bible tells us, Son of God, believe that. Believe that he rose on the third day. Believe that he did what all the Bible says that he did for us. Repent of your sins, that is to change your mind. You know, it's interesting whenever we talk about repentance, uh, we, we list that, you know, all the time through the plan of salvation. I wonder how many times we actually get that. We actually repent. You know that's a change, right? It, it means, that, you know, yes, it's a change of mind, but that means there's going to be a change in your life. That means that you're going to do things differently us. In the end, we must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is the Son of God. We must be baptized. That baptism is a form of that doctrine in which we are teaching. 
Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. We must obey that. What are we obeying? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a physical act that we go through, and on the spiritual end of things, God goes through it with us. And we come in contact with the blood of Christ, and His blood cleanses us of all sins. When we rise up out of that grave, that watery grave, we are rising up to walk a new life, a different life. And that promise is available to everyone and anyone who will come to Him according to His Word. But you must keep that promise. Just as He has promised to save you, you have to keep your promise whenever you become a Christian that you will be faithful to Him. And so we must remain faithful in our lives, even to the point of death. But if we do, he will give us that crown of life. And that's what we're really looking for, isn't it? This this evening, if you are here and you need to obey the gospel or if you need to come back to God, if you just need prayers from the church, if you want to...